quero dizer também que esse, essa é uma iniciativa do grupo de pesquisa GAIST, que é Grupo de Estudos em Imagens, Sonoridades e Tecnologias, que conta com pesquisadores daqui da UFSC, do meu departamento, do Departamento de Artes, da Federal do Espírito Santo, Pedro Marra, da, do Instituto Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, Marcelo Conter, da, da URSS, do Smazer, Cássio, Mário, uh, que são meus colegas de organização. Quero agradecer muito a vocês todos pela, pelo trabalho, enfim. É, quem é brasileiro sabe, quem não é brasileiro talvez imagine a, a, a dificuldade que é nesse momento no país a gente organizar um evento desse tamanho. Eu, eu confesso que no final do ano passado, quando enfim, a gente, o resultado do CNP que atrasou meses, eu imaginei que a conferência não ia acontecer e aí subitamente ah, o CNP que liberou 25% do pedido e a gente tá, vamos, vamos fazer a conferência, então a gente ficou muito feliz, mas ao mesmo tempo muita responsabilidade. Então é muito bom ver vocês aqui e isso é um, é um sinal de que o trabalho justificou e eu espero que a gente continue dialogando com vocês, que eu acho que é o principal. É, conversando com todos vocês aqui e nas próximas edições da conferência. Ah, eu quero agradecer, a lista de agradecimentos agora, eu quero agradecer ao Departamento de Artes, na figura da nossa chefe de departamento, Taraka, mas também conhecida como Andréia. A professora Pati também, que está tá nos ajudando. Quero agradecer imensamente a nossa Secretaria de Artes, na figura da professora é, Maria Borges, a Dúdio, que também ajudou muito a gente. Enfim, a gente quer agradecer um monte de pessoas. Agradecer o pessoal do Bloco do, do, do B, o pessoal do nosso centro. Enfim, esse primeiro dia é sempre meio complicado, que a gente começa a testar tudo para variar o nosso ar-condicionado do nosso prédio, que for. A gente está tentando... É, mas é um, é um sistema tão sofisticado que só tem uma pessoa que sabe mexer nele e a gente está correndo atrás dessa pessoa até agora. Então, vamos torcer que amanhã é, funcione. E fazer algumas, algumas, é, alguns lembretes para vocês. Hoje temos a palestra do Martin Daltrey. Tá? Amanhã nós temos a palestra, também nesse mesmo local, nessa mesma hora, da nossa amiga Shannon Collins, uh, da UCLA. Uh, e amanhã a gente vai fazer sorteio de alguns livros também. Então, bem. Uh, tem, tem toda essa coisa meio uh, espetacular. Né? Assim. E lembrar para vocês que amanhã nós temos painéis de apresentação de manhã, é, duas sessões de manhã. À tarde nós temos duas oficinas, a da Mirna Spitzer e do Felipe Marisca. A Irã. Irã, eu não sou esqueci o sobrenome dele. Que são no, no bloco B. E, e nós temos duas performances do Krishna, é, na Caixa Preta, que é logo no primeiro piso, e do Rodo, o Rodrigo Ramos, que vai ser uma performance às 15, da, às 15 da tarde, no Laguinho. Quem foi na feirinha hoje, sabe, deve ter visto uma, uma estátua de ferro grande, com um laguinho assim, em volta do laguinho, uma coisa bem bucólica. O Rodrigo vai fazer uma performance amanhã às 15 horas. Então, todos convidados a participar das performances e das oficinas. Tá? E na sexta-feira nós temos o um encerramento com uma sessão de performance também na Caixa Preta, de vários dos participantes do, da conferência. Então, isso é legal que nós somos pesquisadores e somos artistas também. Hã? É o quê? O Marcelo está lembrando aqui. Não é uma festa, é um convite. É um convite na sexta-feira à noite, após o encerramento, após, o, após a, a, as performances, tem um karaokê aqui perto da Universidade de Pula, na ruazinha. Então, nós estamos convidando vocês, quem quiser ir, quem quiser se aventurar, a nos acompanhar ao karaokê. Enfim, vai ser divertido. Tá bom? Amanhã a gente troca mais informações. Enfim, vale demais. Eu quero chamar a professora Daraca só para falar duas palavrinhas. Em nome do departamento. É, obrigada, Zé. É, Bem-vindo bem todos. É, é incrível o que o Zé e o grupo conseguiu né, fazer, de estar tá, não só de ter uh, conseguido o o apoio do CNPq e tudo mais, mas só com dinheiro não, eles organizaram muito bem tudo isso, então todos os convidados, muitos, né, conseguiram chegar aqui num momento bem estranho do nosso país. Né? 
Então, o que eu tenho a dizer? O Departamento de Artes está muito feliz, o Departamento de Artes é bem novinho, né? a gente está no nosso terceiro ano só, a gente já, os cursos estão aqui faz tempo, mas o Departamento, enquanto uma unidade das artes, ele é bem recente. Eu também sou recente nesse lugar, né? de chefe de departamento, uma coisa passageira, e vários de nós vamos ainda assumir essa posição. Então, eventos como esse, que unem uh, um pensamento em relação às artes no geral, e em relação às sonoridades em si, que está ligado aos dois cursos que a gente tem no departamento, que são os cursos de cinema e o curso de artes cênicas, é, é muito bem-vindo, né? o máximo que eu puder participar eu vou estar, mediando também aqui direto. A gente tem aqui a, a coordenadora do, do curso de cênicas, a Janaína, que tô, olhou aqui para mim agora sorrindo, eu lembrei, é, o, do cinema que não está aqui nesse momento. Então, assim, o que, que eu tenho a dizer? Bem-vindos, bem-vindos, Marcio Daltrey, bem-vindos, Shannon, que eu não sei quem é, Shannon, Shannon uh, Garland. Bem-vindos, é, bem-vindos à cidade, bem-vindos à universidade, bem-vindos ao Departamento de Artes. E vamos fazer uma grande balbúrgia esta semana. É, só mais um último agradecimento, um agradecimento muito importante. O nosso bolsista Francesco Colim, que está na sala de palmas para ele. E o nosso bolsista colaborador voluntário, Gabriel, que veio para cá também. Nada funcionaria se não fossem eles. Muito obrigado. Eu quero agora chamar o Pedro Marra, da Federal do Espírito Santo, para apresentar o Martin Dolce. Muito obrigado a todo mundo. Aproveitem a palestra. Oi. Oi. Boa noite. É, só um outro picadinho que o, é, a gente comprou, mas você esqueceu aqui. Nós estamos estimulando é, um sistema de tradução simultânea voluntária. Que, tá, que tem acontecido e tem rolado, né, já que a gente tem convidados é, de fora e temos pessoas de fora e não, não falam português, assim como a gente tem pessoas daqui que não falam inglês, então nós estamos tentando estimular é, essa tradução simultânea, tá, gente? É, so, uh, we're, we're trying to make people Uh, voluntarily translate to each other when uh, they are in a presentation on a language they don't know. So please, uh, if you feel like you can collaborate with us or if you feel you need this kind of stuff, just try to locate someone who's doing that, okay? Uh, é sempre um grande, uma grande questão numa conferência internacional essa questão da língua, né? a barreira da língua. Ok? É, então, eu vou apresentar aqui o nosso, nosso convidado, Martin Daltrey. É, lembrando que ele não fala português, tá bom? Mas a gente fez um experimento aqui com uma pílula de português. Ele tomou uma pílula de português que funciona durante um minuto. Se ele tomasse mais em tempo overdose. We made an experience with him. We gave him a, a Portuguese pill. So he's speaking Portuguese for one minute. If it took more, he would like overdose it, okay? So, um, Martin Dalton, professor do Departamento de Música da NYU, New York University, uh, com doutorado na UCLA. Né? Nos últimos anos, uh, tem desenvolvido pesquisas sobre as dinâmicas sociais do som e da escuta em diferentes contextos. Seu trabalho dialoga com a etnomusicologia, com os estudos de som, com a antropologia dos sentidos e com o estudo etnográfico da violência. Seus principais projetos de pesquisa sobre a dimensão sônica da guerra do Iraque, sobre as práticas musicais da União Soviética antes e após o seu término, sobre a música pós-atentado de 11 de setembro de 2001 e sobre a significância multifacetada da voz e da vocalidade possuem uma dimensão em comum. Eles, eles exploram as capacidades e os limites das culturas sonoras em um mundo complexo de mudanças frequentemente violentas. O foco na violência, implícito em vários de seus trabalhos, intensificou-se nos últimos anos, assim como seu engajamento com os estudos de som. Sua pesquisa possui ênfase nos seguintes tópicos. A. A eficácia e fragilidade dos processos culturais. 
B, a fenomenologia da escuta e C, a persistência e transformação das práticas sonoras que têm se mostrado relativamente consistentes em todos os lugares em face à ruptura social. Então, a tradução em português da, 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 da fala dele vai estar toda aqui, tá, gente? E no final a gente vai ter uma sessão de perguntas e respostas, onde eu vou estar fazendo a tradução simultânea, inglês, português, português, inglês, tá? Então, quero chamar aqui, agora, antes que acabe o efeito da pílula, Martin Dalton para com vocês, gente. Obrigado. Colegas, camaradas, boa tarde. Quero, em primeiro lugar, agradecer a Zé Cláudio, Pedro, Marcelo, Dulce, Cássio e Mário por me convidarem a vir falar com vocês. E, em segundo lugar, agradecer vocês por dedicar o tempo a vir aqui hoje. Eu entendo que esse é um momento profundamente desafiador no Brasil, em que vocês estão lutando para manter suas universidades funcionando e independentes. Ao mesmo tempo, meu país está infestado de caos, com as forças da intolerância, da ignorância e do fanatismo trabalhando juntas para enfraquecer nossas instituições democráticas e prejudicar as pessoas dentro e fora de nossas fronteiras. We could say of my president, Elena. Em tempos difíceis, precisamos de solidariedade e empatia. E precisamos de tempo para ouvir e aprender uns com os outros. Quando terminar de falar, espero ouvi-los e aprender com vocês. Obrigado mais uma vez por vir e desculpe minha terrível pronúncia do português. And good night. So, uh, excuse me for sitting, I feel like I'm sitting at a cafe uh, and uh, talking to you in a very informal manner. But the, the cord to my computer only uh, goes this length, so you'll ex excuse me if I sit. I'd like to offer a few caveats, a few notes of caution and context before I begin. Caveat number one. I want to talk to you about what I've learned about the nexus of sound and trauma in wartime Iraq, or whether, rather of what I think I learned about that subject, or what I once thought I had learned, but I'm now not so sure about. If you sense a certain deterioration of certitude in this opening sentence, you are on the right track, as humility, fragility, ambiguity, and uncertainty are some of the enduring qualities that this work has instilled in me. At this point, I don't even know for certain what sound is, let alone trauma, or what the true relation between them might be. These entangled entities each create a kind of impasse, something akin to what Derrida, drawing on the ancient Greeks, liked to call an aporia. There is no circumstance in which we can get to the bottom of them, though it would appear that we are always obligated to try. Caveat number two. While I am at least officially a music scholar, my plan here is not to engage with music specifically, but rather to draw attention to the ground conditions in which human encounters with sounds take place. Sounds, of course, you don't need me to tell you this, include but vastly exceed the ones that we call the code as music. I'm not going to deal with the weaponization of musical sound in US detention facilities in Iraq or the use of music as a tool of reconciliation in the wake of the Iraq War, although these are important, even urgent, subjects. All of this is to say that music is an aporia too, but it's one that I don't address today. Caveat number three. I will be presenting my knowledge, or quasi-knowledge, of this aporetic topic in a form that some of you may find a bit anachronistic. 
we are living in the age that Zygmunt Bauman, the brilliant Polish philosopher who died in 2017, presciently named liquid modernity, where the seemingly solid societal structures and categories that ground us are revealed to be increasingly unstable, in flux, fluid. At its poles, our planet is literally melting, and this literal melt, along with the existential liquefaction that accompanies it, has only sharpened the humanity's collective distrust of structuralist paradigms and empirical certitudes, and therefore of our ability to state with the detached confidence of the scientists, sound is X, violence is Y, trauma is Z. One could argue that the belief that we could be detached observers of a stable world is what got us into this mess in the first place. This is how I feel anyway. And so my instinct is to always look for complexity, ambiguity, entanglement, messiness, and flow, and to be skeptical of the stable borders and boxes and firewalls and taxonomies and schema and other categorizing structures. But if I learned one thing in working with US military service members and Iraqi civilians on questions of sound in wartime, it is this. Do you people know the phrase, there are no atheists in foxholes? Have you ever heard that phrase? So uh, this is a phrase that was widely attributed to uh, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who subsequently became the US president. Uh, and you know, I, I think its meaning is, is obvious. It means that in, in extreme situations of extreme precarity, even the most cynical among us may seek, you know, seek comfort in, uh, you know, in, in his instance, he was saying, in, in, in some sort of a higher power. So, Pache, Dwight D. Eisenhower, I don't know if there are no atheists in foxholes, but there are definitely no post-structuralists in them. <laughs> People under fire don't have the luxury of critiquing the systems of knowledge and power that permeate their lives, or deconstructing binaries in order to create space for anti-structural thinking. No. People in combat zones crave structures and other sureties. They need them to maintain sanity in an insane world. The taxonomy, the list, the binary, these are not, or not only, the tired artifacts of positivism. They are the kind of thing that Michel de Certeau called tactics of the weak, or in a different vein altogether, what Kenneth Burke in an utterance that later became associated with the novelist and blues scholar Albert Murray called Equipment for Living. They are, like the blues itself, thought edifices keyed to the task of survival. And so, despite my skepticism of things that project the illusion of stability, I'm going to talk to you today about structures, structures of listening that my colleagues in Iraq and in the US military helped me discern by telling me their stories. To be clear, the names of these structures and their interrelationship are my inventions. By collating their stories, amplifying the commonalities between them, and abstracting these commonalities into schema that form the second half of this paper, I hope to help my colleagues make sense of a fraught wartime environment that was in constant danger of slipping into utter senselessness. This is me singing the blues for them. I begin with some words that are not my own, words that in my mind express the relationship between sound and violence more vividly than I ever could. So here, I guess, um, if, if you're capable, I would urge you to read the English on the screen uh, and the Portuguese can, can um, kind of serve as an adjunct.
Nowhere are the politics of sound more consequential or corrosive. Nowhere the connection between sound and violence more direct than in wartime. Throughout history, as these quotations attest, chroniclers of war have been transfixed by the sounds of battle. Sounds that blur the distinction between signal and noise, between logos and affect, between acoustics and aggression, between biopower and necropolitics. The intensity of battle since the advent of the arrest of the ancients and their mechanized cavalry, the sounds of modern warfare have often exceeded the range of its shocking sights and noxious smells. The distant thunder of cannon may be the only indicator that a battle was taking place beyond the next hill. The hissing shriek of a missile and the strangely melodious cooing of mortars in flight alert large populations to the imminent presence of as yet unseen projectiles. The ground-shaking explosions of these munitions can terrorize or thrill auditors who then find themselves compelled to imagine physical carnage that they may never actually see. The 2003 US-led military intervention in Iraq was no exception. From the first sorties of the so-called shock and awe operation on March 21st, 2003, a bombing campaign that was designed to be deafening, the sonic dimension of Operation Iraqi Freedom was a source of intense preoccupation and consternation for Iraqi civilians. With time, as the insurgency gathered strength, American military service members too became aware of their vulnerability to the intense sounds of combat. Like those exposed to combat before them, service members and Iraqi civilians have struggled within the confines of written language to evoke the urgency and omnipresence of wartime sounds. Here are some of their attempts. Thank you for your patience. Okay.
So with these utterances hanging in the air, I'm now going to tell you a bit about how people during the Iraq War learned to listen to the sounds that surrounded them, how these sounds occasionally overpowered them, and how they struggled to maintain their status as auditors in the face of them. Now I use the term auditor rather than listener because it has a double sense that's valuable to me here. From the Latin audire, uh, to audit means to hear. At the same time, in the profession of accounting, an auditor is not a listener, but a professional examiner, one who evaluates and holds people accountable for their actions. I like to argue that everyone who heard, who lived, who survived this conflict possesses the right to hold the decision makers on all sides accountable for the events that they experienced. So auditor. My core contention here is that in wartime, sound is more than sound. This paradoxical formulation can be taken in two ways. First, for those who have learned to listen to them, to extract ta tactical information from them, wartime sounds are crucial tools in the enterprise of survival. This explains the extreme labors that wartime auditors put into the act of listening and the extreme virtuosity of many of their listening acts. Sound in wartime simply has a greater significance than it does at other times. In an environment where to see is to risk being seen, and therefore becoming a target, combatants and bystanders alike strive to minimize their visual exposure, ducking behind barriers or seeking refuge in bomb stop shelters or windowless staircases. In combat, when one looks, one looks quickly, tactically, just long enough to determine the location of a threat or target before retreating back to the relative safety of not seeing and being unseen. The sounds of combat, by contrast, are more readily continuously available, flowing around corners, through windows and walls and bodies. Wartime violence thus enforces a situation in which the ubiquitous audible can at times take precedence over the sporadic visible. For those of you who read Jacques Rancière, this amounts to a painfully literal distribution of the sensible. Sound travels farther than touch, faster than odor, and in a more immersive fashion than the visible, which is subject to sight lines and sunrises. Sound is thus not just one phenomenon among others, it is a phenomenon and the insistent environment within which other phenomena are experienced. The second sense in which I deploy the impossible phrase, sound is more than sound, is this. When audible vibrations are produced by violent acts, aspects of the sound and the violent act fuse together to produce new sensory objects that place new demands on those who are exposed to them. Sound is the public modality through which armed violence is most efficiently distributed. One person is penetrated by a bullet. No one sees it fly, but thousands may flinch at its explosive report. This, by the way, is why I almost never play the sounds I recorded in Iraq for audiences. First emanating from speakers such as these, they wouldn't trigger the sharp pain response that truly loud weapon sounds do. Second, resonating in a lovely room like this, we would be listening to them from a position of safety. We would be listening to the sound without experiencing the terror that is an integral aspect of its re reception on the battlefield. Listening to the sounds of weapons here today would create the misimpression that we understand what it would be like to experience them. This may seem like a minor point, but it's actually an ontological one. The phrase, the sounds of war, is always already a lie. These are not sounds. These are new sensory objects, and the acoustical demands they place on auditors are only part of the puzzle. What does it mean to encounter one of these objects, a sound indissociable from the proximate threat of violence? What does it mean to encounter it with a vulnerable body whose bloodstream is coursing with cortisol and adrenaline, the fight or flight chemicals that the body produces when it is in peril. What is it like to encounter a sound knowing that at any moment you might be called upon to kill those who produced it or to be killed by them? What kind of invasion of your space and your body is a sound that is such an intimate product of the act of killing? What kinds of fear and anger and exhaustion are produced by encounters such as these? Some of you in the audience may know the answer to that question, and I'll return to that at the end of this talk. In wartime, sound is more than sound. It is simultaneously a vital source of information and a profound source of trauma. It is a sign and a weapon, a signal and an attack, 
an index and a manifestation of violence. With this paradox in mind, and also keeping in mind my caveat about structures, here is one of the structural models for categorizing wartime sounds that I created in dialogue with a large number of Iraqi and American auditors. So here's the schema, and we move from the uh, periphery to the center. Distant gunfire was such a constant presence during Operation Iraqi Freedom that experienced civilians and service members regularly claimed to no longer hear it. Only those who were new to the theater of war commented upon the popping sounds of weapons off in the distance. Their more seasoned comrades teased them about their overly acute hearing. In the words of a soldier stationed in a small forward operating base outside Baghdad, you hear it so often it becomes background noise. It's just different than the IEDs exploding or mortars hitting. You just don't even care about the shooting unless it's sustained or you can tell it's people actually shooting at each other back and forth. The background noise becomes inaudible, became inaudible to us almost. New units would show up, a visiting team of investigators or somebody would show up and they'd be like, ooh, did you hear that? And you're like, what? And they're like, that's shooting. And oh, yeah, yeah, that's probably, you know, this neighborhood because they always shoot at noon. Who knows? Distant gunfire became part of what I suggest we call the audible inaudible, a conceptual space that housed sounds so distant and or ubiquitous that they no longer drew the attention of the experienced auditor. To place a sound in the audible inaudible is to say that it was no longer fully there, no longer available to the auditors whose unconscious or at most quasi-conscious alteration of perceptual priorities created the zone in the first place. It was a sound that was not really a sound. Now this is not because they had hearing loss, although hearing loss was, as we'll discuss, a major uh, liability that, that people struggled with. The sound was technically audible, but it had been pushed out of, out of consciousness. So in tension with my point that wartime sound is more than sound, we now have to acknowledge that sometimes sound is less than sound. And so now you can already, at the beginning, feel my model beginning to kind of come unglued. In contrast to the assumption that expert listening always involves greater acuity than naive listening, auditory expertise in wartime Iraq did not amount to an overall sharpening of the ears, but a combination of sharpening and deadening. In order to be effective fighters, service members needed to become inured to some sounds and hyper-attuned to others. Iraqi civilians made strikingly similar moves in this way, over time, experienced auditors in both of these populations came to embody the concept of an acoustic filter. Through repeated acts of listening, their mindful bodies learned to effectively amplify some sounds and attenuate others. For those who learned how to not hear the distant sounds of war, the audible and audible amounted to a portable audiotopia, that's Josh Kuhn's term, a tantalizing zone of imagined quiescence where experienced ears could rest and jangled nerves could settle. It was also a badge of honor. Nearly all of my interlocutors, civilian and military alike, took great pride in their ability to desensitize themselves to the sensory material of violence in this way. They regarded it as proof that they were no longer green or inexperienced, but battle-hardened or experienced. The distant, audible, and audible was one of several modes of inaudition or non-listening that service members and civilians shared. One thread that ran through their testimonies was the importance of learning how to tune things out. When gunfire got closer, however, experienced ears perked up. It was in the middle distance that most auditors began to pay acute attention to the unique sounds and approximate locations of particular weapons. Visual obstruction from buildings and topographical features, along with the intense speed of bullets in flight, often rendered it impossible to observe the details of an urban firefight with the eyes. The ears, by contrast, had less trouble determining that shots had been fired. Having learned over time to decode the acousmatic sounds of battle, experienced auditors were able to construct rich and detailed audio narratives of battles that were fully within earshot, but were not or were only partially visible. They became, in this situation, virtuosic hermeneutes or interpreters, cultivating and taking pride in their ability to identify sounds, interpret their significance, and map them onto their knowledge of the surrounding neighborhoods. 
we might thus imagine a second conceptual zone, more proximate than the audible and audible, a zone in which gunfire was close enough to attract the attention of experienced auditors, but still too far away to pose a physical threat. In this narrational zone, experienced auditors told detailed stories of battles they could not see but could only hear. The stories that emerged from within this zone acquired greater accuracy and detail as auditors' combat experience increased. An army captain who served in Iraq in 2003 and 2004 explained that his audio narratives got more detailed as his knowledge of the surrounding neighborhoods and the different fighting groups in those neighborhoods grew. One of the things that we started noticing uh, is we could tell if a police station was being hit or if they were shooting at the government building downtown or if it was at the propane distribution spot or wherever based on where the stuff was coming from. Not necessarily whether it was incoming to us, but you could just tell kind of what part of town, where it was hitting, and it helped us determine which little fob or mini enclave of troops we had to send out and say, hey, what's going on? The sounds of weapons took on a much greater urgency when they signaled the imminent presence of projectiles or shrapnel in the spaces where auditors found themselves. When gunfire was nearby, when the zipping sounds of bullets displacing air told auditors that they had been targeted but narrowly missed, the richness and detail of the narrational zone collapsed into the briefest tactical assessment. The sound came from this direction, so I run this way. The sound came from this direction, so I shoot in that direction. Close in, in this tactical zone, auditors trained their skills of echolocation to determine the proximity of explosions, the trajectory of bullets, and the location of shooters. As an Air Force major who served in Iraq in 2006 described it, beneath the engine sounds, transmission sounds, road noise, static over the radio, and ambient noises, everybody is very much in tune, listening for gunfire or rocket fire. And we had, an incident, we had incidents of people firing rockets or mortars at us, and it was very much like the movies, because you hear the whistling sound that goes by you, and the first thing that pops in your mind is, oh my god, somebody's shooting at us. Secondly, you say, oh, I heard the whistling sound, that means that they missed, and it already went by us. And the third thing is, okay, where is that clown that just shot at me? Iraqi civilians did their best to stay out of the tactical zone, but it enveloped them nonetheless. The story of Iraqi deaths, which as we know, have never been properly quantified, but surely number in the hundreds of thousands. This story unfolds within the zone where sounds overlapped with the projectiles that produced them, where eerie silences often preceded coordinated insurgent attacks, and where the sudden explosion of suicide bombers, those weaponized selves who took the most Iraqi lives, relied on a kind of stealth that was a tacit acknowledgement of the efficacy of civilian tactical listening. The IED, uh, improvised explosive device, and the suicide bomber were, in this sense, technologies that hacked and disabled the embodied defenses that experienced auditors set, auditors set up. No amount of tactical listening could foil them, which made the tactical zone a space of heightened vulnerability and interpretive failure. In the tactical zone, people listened with their ears, but also with their skin, their chest cavities, the hair on the back of their necks, the pads of their feet, their viscera. The loud sounds of weaponry regularly bled into the realm of the haptic when they were this close up. When they were even closer and even louder, these sounds lost their capacity to serve as a resource, a text to be interpreted, an illuminating index of a nearby violent act. At the closest distances, the loudest sounds assaulted bodies, and they did so before any tactical judgment or meaningful interpretation could possibly be made. We thus need to distinguish one more zone, even more proximate than the zone where sound acquires immediate tactical significance, the space in which sounds produce physiological damage, the trauma zone. The physiological liability of time spent in this zone began with tinnitus and hearing loss, the two most common injuries sustained by military service members and civilians alike. At the same time, while the complex of psychological wounds that the Western medical community now calls post-traumatic stress disorder can be sustained throughout this striated, striated space of listening stances, it is particularly pronounced here, close in, where sound exerts its greatest corporeal and psychological effects, where its ontological excess is greatest. At the center of the trauma zone is the place where our epistemologies regarding sound break down completely. What we call sound 
is generally understood to be the orally apprehensible presence of compression waves moving through a medium. The very compression waves that we hear as sounds, if they are sufficiently powerful and you are sufficiently near their source, are no longer perceived as sound, or even as a blend of the auditory and the haptic, but as blunt force, the force of a large object smashing against your body. The signature injury of the Iraq War, the traumatic brain injury, or TBI, could be sustained when the supersonic blast wave of an IED explosion forcefully jostled the brain against the wall of the skull, creating small contusions that can manifest as a lifelong crippling disability, or worse. This very compression wave slows down and regularizes over time to become the sound of the explosion, which returns to the incapacitated auditor in the form of an echoic boom. Thousands of military service members and Iraqi combatants and exponentially more Iraqi civilians had their ears and brains permanently damaged by a perturbation of the air that was received as sound by those who enjoyed the luxury of distance. In the presence of sounds, that inflict permanent and profound physiological damage, our terminology begins to fail us. At this level of intensity, we can no longer treat these sounds as texts, or speak of interpreting them, or even of listening to them, or even of witnessing them. Our auditory regimes and structures of listening are left shattered by these sounds that are not more than sounds, but not yet or no longer sounds. When listening ends and raw exposure begins, when sounds no longer herald death and destruction through their indexicality, but create death and psychological destruction through their sheer materiality, this is the terminal point against which we must calibrate the relationship between sound and violence. The Iraq War was responsible for countless such moments. At the thanatosonic core that stands at the center of the trauma zone, the connection between sound and violence is absolute. When faced with a sound that deafens, a sound that concusses, a sound that knocks you out and creates permanent brain damage, human agency is, if only temporarily, disabled. And life in the wake of such an encounter can be irrevocably altered or radically shortened. These sounds are not just more than sounds, they are more than us. Okay, a few notes in conclusion. What can we learn? by thinking in terms of this striated space of heightened audition and inaudition. One thing that I've learned is that the very structures of listening that are key for survival become pathological when they are transferred to peacetime life. The militarized auditory regime people enter in wartime often exerts a, exerts a persistent form of power over auditors, holding them in its grip even when the danger lessens. This is one definition of post-traumatic stress, the, the inability of the body to exit the sensory regimes that it was forced into in wartime. Having entered a wartime auditory regime where sounds are more than sounds, having deadened oneself to the presence of sounds that are less than sounds, some auditors find these bodily habits difficult or even impossible to unlearn. The flashbacks, the hyperacuity and hyperaggression, and the emotional withdrawal associated with PTSD are entangled with the long half-life of the sensory indoctrination of wartime survival demands. Another thing that I've learned is that in wartime and peacetime, in audition and audition are tied to ethics. We all have sounds that we have learned to ignore. Uh, I live in New York City, and when I moved there, the uh, the sounds of fire engines and tourists uh, throwing up, barfing uh, on the street outside my apartment building as they left the bars on Bleecker Street at two o'clock in the morning heading to the subway, those sounds would wake me up. Uh, after some period of time, they no longer woke me up, right? So I'm, I'm sure everyone, you know, we're, we're all urbanites of one sort or another, right? Everyone, we have these, these, the, this, kind of ability, and it's not really a choice that we make, is it, right? Um, when I, well, let me, let me read this and I'll come back to you. Well, so, um, ele está dizendo que quando ele era mais jovem, ele morava no centro de Nova York, e muitas vezes ele era acordado pelo barulho do, dos caminhões na rua Bleecker e pelo barulho dos bêbados vomitando na rua quando saíram das baladas, e iam para o metrô. 
né? e ao longo do tempo ele parou de se incomodar com isso, parou de acordar né? com, com, esse, com esses sons. Né? Now, when I wrote this book uh, that was published in 2015, I made a very strong uh, distinction between wartime and peacetime. And I vaguely remember saying in the book something like, you know, I, I learned how to block out the sounds of fire engines and traffic and stuff in New York. And the difference between that act that I made and the act that these people were making is that the sounds that I was blocking out were kind of ethically neutral sounds of urban life, and that the sounds that the people in wartime were blocking out were the sounds of people killing one another. Então, né, no livro ele fez uma distinção muito clara entre o processo que ele fazia de bloquear esses sons cotidianos da cidade e os sons é, da guerra, porque tinha aí uma um corte ético muito forte, né, no sentido de que os sons da cidade eram eticamente é, irrelevantes, enquanto os sons da guerra do Iraque, eles efetivamente matavam pessoas. I no longer think that that is true. Eu não acredito mais nessa divisão. I no longer think that there is, well, I've, in several years of talking to people about these experiences, I've had too many people tell me uh, about experiences that they have had simply in urban environments that are not classed as wartime, you know, as combat zones, that uh, I, I now think that this, this is another moment at which the sort of clean structure, the clean striated space, the Delusian striated space gets smoothed out um, by just the exigencies of, of life. É, então, conversando com as pessoas, ele não acredita mais nisso, porque ele ouviu vários relatos de gente que claramente não estava naquilo que a gente chama de zonas de guerra, mas que produziam uma, algo semelhante às zonas de guerra, que, tinha a ver, que tem a ver com esse momento em que aquilo que Deleuze chama de espaço estreado se torna é, liso, né, ou se vai, vai, é, vai se tornar liso. Ok. So we all have sounds that we've learned to ignore. I think that we can agree that ethical thought and action begin with an acknowledgement of the presence of the other. I see you, I hear you, and in so doing, I acknowledge that I might have some kind of responsibility toward you. That's sort of the ground condition upon which ethical action is, is, is built, uh, according to Levinas and others. If this is the case, then the zone of the audible and audible and the enforced in audition of the trauma zone amount to a constriction of the horizon within which ethical thought and action obtain. In other words, if my zone of inaudition, of non-listening, expands to the point where I no longer hear that you exist, I am not faced with the question of whether and how to act in relation to you. My mechanism of ethical thought and action is disabled. We've all heard about how war dehumanizes people, and that's an abstraction. But the audible and audible is a very specific example of how this dehumanization takes place. It takes place with surgical precision through the vector of sound and listening. To be clear, I'm not blaming wartime auditors for no longer hearing the chatter of gunfire in the distance. In wartime, in audition is not optional. Tuning out distant gunfire is an absolutely necessary survival tactic if you are to remain sane and alive. And the intense and tra traumatic sounds that can knock you out are never encountered by choice. They are bigger than you. They force themselves upon you. These small moments of ethical disabling through non-hearing are forced upon wartime auditors by the violent soundscapes within which they are suspended. What does this say about the relationship between humans and sounds? Wartime sound itself, the sound that is more or less than or too big or too fast to be a sound, this toxic chameleon may not be wholly deterministic of human behavior, but it does dictate a surprising amount of terms for its beleaguered auditors. By forcing them into an ethically degraded topography, the ubiquitous sounds of the audible and audible and the traumatic sounds of close contact demonstrate that they are in possession of the power, not us. 
And lest you think I'm anthropomorphizing these sounds, let's remember that they are always coaxed into existence by human actors who remain responsible for them even though they might not intend them or be able to control them. The sonic degradation of ethical thought and action is striking in wartime, but those of us lucky enough to live in relatively peaceful situations are not immune to it. So this is, this is where I depart from my own, the argument that my book made. What legions of unacknowledged others lie within our horizons of hearing as a physiological act, but outside our horizons of listening as an intentional activity? What suffering, what precarity, what inconvenient lives do you and I submit to the anesthetizing process of inaudition? This is another source of my waning certitude. I thought I was describing wartime actions that were separate from me, but life in a wound. In the end, and this is my conclusion, while I still think structural thinking is an important tool for people in precarious situations, I must admit that my listening zones have a lot of fiction in them. They are never as clearly delineated as I just made them seem, and no auditor moves with absolute confidence and virtuosity within them. They're more of a, they're more of a kind of a surreal space. If they're a space at all, they're, they're sort of a surreal, surreal space in which what is far away can all of a sudden appear to be near, right? So it's, it's, it's more of a, a kind of a, 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 an absurd space than uh, any kind of clean, cleanly strident space. Então, é, o que está dizendo aqui, mais do que esse espaço tão bem delimitado, né, que vocês talvez tenham, que a gente talvez tenha, seja um espaço surreal, onde de repente aquilo que está longe se torna perto, que é esse sentido de que o espaço seriado se torna vivo. I have a friend named Ben Harbert. He's an ethnomusicologist at Georgetown University in um, Washington, D.C. And Ben works, uh, among other things, he works in prisons, in American prisons. He's a, sort of an, a, a music ethnographer of prisons. And Ben and a very large number of prisoners have read my book. E muitos prisioneiros leram o livro do Dolphin. And the thing that they that they they agreed with a lot of they they agreed that a lot of the listening skills that they developed in prison remarkably kind of track with these wartime listening skills that people developed in Iraq. Então muitas das habilidades de escuta que os prisioneiros aprenderam quando estavam é, presos pareciam muito com as habilidades discuta que os soldados aprendiam durante a guerra. But there were important differences as well. One of which was that 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 perception of distance uh, when you are enclosed, when you are detained within a metal cell, their ability to sort of perceive what was close and what was far away was compromised. Mas tinha algumas diferenças, como por exemplo, que uh, o fato de quando você está trancado numa cela de metal pequena é, uma das habilidades que se torna compro muito comprometida é de perceber a diferença entre distância e proximidade. And so it was in talking to him that I began kind of thinking about uh, things that that my friends in Iraq told me that didn't really kind of make sense within my model, you know, and, and uh, it's just to say that uh, this kind this kind of structured listening is the ideal that uh, that it's, it's as good as it gets, really. It's, it's as good a situation as one can construct for oneself in a situation of precarity. Então, isso revelou para ele algumas coisas que, quando ele mostrou o modelo para os amigos é, que eram cidadãos iraquianos, cidadãos ele mostrou o modelo e algumas coisas do modelo simplesmente não faziam sentido para a experiência iraquiana. Então, é como se... É, esse modelo é o melhor possível, é o melhor dos mundos para se sobreviver no estado de guerra, digamos assim. And soldiers and Iraqi civilians want to be, they want to believe that they can, with great accuracy, discern one caliber bullet from another, um, a large explosion far away from a close explosion, you know, smaller explosion closer in. They want, they want, and they can often, but not always, right? So there's the, the, 
the, the thing that is not present here is a cloud of failure, right? Is the ever-present uh, ever potential for failure and the potential for the absurd or the surreal or the, the kind of illogical, um, the, uh, a kind of a surreal spatiality to, to take place. So if we could kind of make this, make this model, which is, which is individual to each person, you understand, right? Which is constructed by each person. If we could make it kind of uh, move in a sort of a nauseating fashion and put some clouds, you know, passing over it, then it would be a truer representation of what's going on. Então, é, os soldados durante a guerra, eles queriam acreditar, eles realmente acreditavam que eles eram capazes, de, pela escuta, é, distinguir o calibre de uma bala, de, 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 calibre de diferentes balas, é, o tamanho da explosão, a proximidade da explosão, e muitas vezes eles realmente conseguiam fazer isso, mas muitas vezes eles também falhavam. Então, o que falta nesse modelo seria uma certa nuvem de, 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 de incerteza, né, que vai borrar os limites dessas zonas. All right. The infamous fog of war casts its dark shadows upon my zones, smoothing out their clean striations and causing acts of misprision when we the most confident auditors. Recently, as I was listening to a colleague describe her project on musicalized depictions of war on the Napoleonic stage, it hit me that my zones bear the same spectral, hyperreal relation to life that music does. And here, to be clear, I have to say, I'm talking about music, the, the kind of music that we cherish, the kind of music that we value, music that is actually music. Uh, and I have to make that qualification because my colleague Suzanne Cusick and I have, uh, she primarily, uh, have spent a lot of time documenting incidents where in this wartime situation, the American um, intelligence services weaponized music and, and used it as an instrument of torture or interrogation for detainees. So I'm not talking about that music, uh, I'm talking about the music that we think of when we say the word music. I'll just go on. So back to music that is music. Just as a song about love is a radical intensification, reduction, and poetic distortion of the quality that it purports to describe. Just as it cannot capture, but can only gesture at the durational experience of love's banalities and complexities and ambiguities and entanglements, so does my model, any model, fail to depict any aspect of life. Songs and models are structures, and I think we agree that the structured nature of music is one of the things that makes it powerful for precarious people. It's part of what makes the blues equipment for living in Murray's beautiful phrase. Songs and models like this are structures that purport to explicate, but can only evoke and provoke. They evoke moods without ever really cataloging their contents, and they provoke questions without ever really providing answers. And so I end with questions more than I had when I began this project. Questions about the ethics, politics, and poetics of wartime sound, acoustological questions, hauntological questions, mute, head-scratching, unproductive questions that slide smoothly into confusion and anxiety and self-doubt and self-loathing, questions that disappear into the inexhaustible maws of the aporiae that appear to pull them out of me. I am hollowed out by these questions. And I imagine you are too. And if we are, and I hope you understand the conditional nature of we, I don't want to be making assumptions about you or you're an audience I don't know. You may have had experiences that are disconcertingly similar to those of the people in Iraq that I, that I spoke to. So, so you'll, you'll understand the scare quotes on that we. If we are, imagine the plight of the legions of selves who regularly experience extreme acoustical violence, people with whom you and I are multiply entangled who have to live these issues and not just think them. So I leave the last words to them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bom, é, vamos agora 
fazer perguntas. Né? Antes, só, só uma coisinha é, que eu esqueci, queria agradecer à aluna é, Laís, me faltou o, nome agora, o sobrenome dela agora, que é a aluna minha lá na UFS, que fez a tradução do texto, eu depois só revisei ela que fez aqui essa tradução que está bem boa para a gente. Valeu. Vamos fazer, deixa eu, eu vou, eu vou anotando aqui. É, vamos, vamos fazer uma rodada de três. Você, o Henrique e Beatriz, tá bom? Você vai traduzir, né? Se eu vou traduzir, mas se você quiser falar em é, é, Não, inglês, melhor falar em português. Tudo bem, tudo bem. É, então, é, eu sou do Rio de Janeiro, né? meu nome é Ana Inácio, e, e justamente com a, com a apresentação dele, eu lembrei o um último evento da... Eu moro em Santa Teresa e aí a gente tem muita, muito som de guerra, né? muito som de guerra, tiroteio, e a última vez foi, tipo, numa segunda-feira, 5 horas da manhã. E eu vou compartilhar isso com vocês, eu quero falar para ele e, e ver ele comentar, porque o que eu percebi depois, porque eu pensei que era briga entre facções, que era 5 horas da manhã, 5, 6 horas da manhã, numa segunda-feira. E aí, depois, conversando com todo mundo, eu descobri que era a Polícia da Paz que tinham explodido um caixa eletrônico da, da, da Caixa Econômica Federal na cidade. E, enfim, esse som de guerra, na verdade, da polícia da paz é uma forma de controle do governo e trazendo sofrimento para as pessoas, justamente na hora que elas vão sair de casa, 5 horas, 6 horas da manhã, que elas vão levar as crianças para a escola, que elas vão sair para trabalhar. Então, porque, na verdade, o, o ético correto seria se eles têm alguém, alguém explodiu e eles acreditam que pode ser um, um criminoso que esteja dentro daquela comunidade, eles deveriam investigar, né? eles deveriam ter polícia de inteligência, investigar. Então, na verdade, esse som de guerra, esse tiroteio, ele é utilizado para intimidar, para controlar, no caso das pessoas da comunidade, e quem está no entorno, né, porque Santa Teresa é uma alta comunidade fica embaixo. Então, a gente ouve como se estivesse dentro de casa, mas está acontecendo ali embaixo. Então, e quem está em volta, aí depende do, do posicionamento político de cada um. Ou vai empatizar e procurar saber como eu fiz, ou vai achar que o governo está trabalhando e tal. Então, essa é uma questão. E a outra questão que eu queria perguntar para ele e para todo mundo, porque eu também estou pesquisando, procurando reunir essa questão, da, eu pesquiso a arte e tecnologia, e as atividades de música e arte eletrônica estão meio no paralelo atualmente, eu estou tentando ver se eu consigo unir. Então, eu gostaria de saber se ele sabe, é, e se vocês sabem, para falar para mim, se existe alguma pesquisa relacionada a sonoridades, timbres, é, escalas. A gente sabe que tem aquela coisa lá atrás, né, do Pitágoras, do tal, tal, mas se alguém sabe de algum estudo que, possa, que esteja sendo feito, que possa reprogramar é, esses danos, esses traumas, essa violência, né? é, a única coisa que eu conheço realmente é o silêncio e a meditação, mas gostaria de saber se existe alguma coisa. Obrigada. Eu vou tentar aqui, mas você me ajuda se estiver faltando algo. Seu nome é qual é mesmo? Ellen. So, uh, Ellen, she lives in Rio, and she wanted you to comment on a situation she lived in Rio. Uh, she lives in Santa Teresa, which is a, uh, a neighborhood and a community in the city center, right, downtown. And... Uh, She was, it was Monday, and it was about half past five, six o'clock in the morning when she woke up with, with shots, right? Uh, at first she thought it was uh, drug dealers fighting against, uh, one against each other, and then she knew it was the peace police, right? And so, She, she's wondering uh, this kind of, of, of gun shooting as a, well, we could say, as a technique for scaring the population, right? Uh, to keep control of population. And it, what's interesting in the, in the case of uh, Santa Teresa is that 
The neighborhood is on the top of the hills, and the community is on its base. Huh? Yeah, the rich one. Yeah, the the, the, the rich ones are, are in the top, and the, exa exactly, exa yeah, the middle class in the top, right, and the 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 poorer on the base, right. So it sounds as if it's it's inside your house, and uh, the population also get divided uh, ideologically because there are people who try to empathize and try to understand what, what, what's happening and the ones who think that, that, that that's okay, that's it, that's the state acting in, or, in order to keep uh, security around, right? No, this is not just shotguns, it's helicopters and explosions and, and she's saying that th this, this specific case uh, was due to an explosion of, uh, of, of an ATM in the city that made the peace police go up the, the, the Santa Teresa, right? And uh, then she asked a, a particular question on her research topic, if anyone or if you uh, know any research on art, right, and uh, music, and, and well, a thing of therapeutic uh, techniques for dealing with trauma, right? Yes, the the the, 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 the sonic trauma, because she's researching on that. Sim, exatamente. Só só vou traduzir de uma vez, porque senão eu não vou conseguir. Uh, uh, we're making a round, but I'm, but I'm translating each one, so or, yeah. otherwise I, I won't be able to do it. Oh, you can't do all, you can't wait to do like, yeah. 15 minutes of Portuguese. And... <laughs> very sad, very sad. Bom, boa noite. Lembrando Mori Schaefer, ele diz, eu lembro claramente, que a guerra, para ser eficaz e verdadeira, ela tem que ser barulhenta. Né, e que o barulho só vem aumentando com o tipo de, de armamentos que vem usando. É, esse é um comentário, eu gostaria de ouvir. É, uma outra situação, é, quando ele fala do ruído sagrado, né, uh, ele diz que o ruído sagrado é cada vez mais potente. Né? E uma vez que eu tive a oportunidade de falar com ele, faz muito tempo, eu perguntei para ele se esse ruído sagrado se caracterizava por um timbre especial. Ele disse, ah, muito interessante. Vá procurar saber e me responda. Então, eu acho que você respondeu um pouco dessa pergunta ao é, relacionar todas as é, reações físicas, etc., emotivas, com um tipo de armamento. Deu para dar uma palavra? Sim, sim, sim. Obrigada. Ela está comentando e perguntando se você comentou on a Murray Schaefer's quotation on the war and the sounds of war and that sound uh, that war is efficient when it's noisy and the noisier it is the more efficient it is uh, and remembering the concept of the sacred noise that's uh, becoming even, uh, more and more powerful nowadays right so then she asked, she, she once had the, the opportunity to ask Schaefer if there, were, if there would be a specific timba that uh, would characterize uh, the, the, the sacred noise. And he, he answered, oh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, why don't you research it and then tell me? So she's saying that you, you, you might have found this timber, uh, she would like you to comment on those. É, eu queria só complementar o que, ela, o que falou a Ellen. Essa situação da polícia entrar na favela tirando, ela existe desde que existe favela. O próprio Paulo Freire, quando foi, foi pesquisar para o método dele, o favelado, o pobre, identificava Estado, governo ou justiça como policial que entrava na casa dele para matá-lo. 
é a identificação que o pobre tem com o Estado. Bom, agora eu queria fazer um comentário seguinte. Quando eu era criança, eu conhecia alguns internacionais neuróticos de guerra brasileiros que tinham lutado. A lembrança que eles tinham da, da, da guerra era realmente o som. Então, se você soltasse um foguete, o cara entrava debaixo do primeiro lugar. Mas os europeus que eu conheço que viveram a guerra, eles não têm lembrança de som. Eles têm lembrança de fome. Ou seja, italianos, franceses, os dois ingleses que eu conheci, foram países lugares muito bombardeados, eles não lembram de um som, eles lembram de passar fome. Eu queria que ele comentasse um pouco essas duas sensações muito ruins. Tudo bem. É, então, ah, eu estou só lembrando aqui que... Beatriz, só lembrando aqui que... Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Beatriz is adding to Alan that uh, this relation of the police and the slums, uh, they have always been like this. Uh, police have, or have like, since, since ever entered the slums uh, shooting, right? And that's, uh, how, that, that's why uh, poor populations in Brazil uh, identify the agents of the state with, with violence, right? And she's saying that uh, Brazilian veterans on the Second World War, they uh, remember their experience in, in war through sound. For example, when they listen to fireworks, uh, they would remember they were in the war and then go hide themselves. But at the same time, uh, Europeans who she talked to, uh, Italians, British people, French, they remember not of sounds, but they remember of hunger, right? Uh, so she wants to know if you see any relation uh, among those two terrible experiences of sound trauma and hunger tra trauma. You answer three, and then? Great. Uh, thank you for those uh, three uh, ex exciting and thoughtful and troubling questions. So, uh, let's see, where to begin? So shooting, so the, uh, to deal with Ellen, your story about, about um, your story encapsulates a lot of the same energies that I discovered in talking to civilians and service members in the war. Uh, and I think, I think the, the situation in urban Brazil is uh, kind of exactly what I had in mind when I realized that my distinction between wartime and peacetime uh, was was not um, was not adequate. Uh, Brazil seems to sit right in between, uh, and uh, you know, I, 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 my my impression is that that uh, life uh, can, depending on who you are, and what, what social class you occupy, and what resources you have, your life can be very much like the lives of Iraqi civilians in, uh, who are who are. Regularly, even if they're never shot, even if they are never, you know, the like never the victim, even if their bodies are never penetrated by metal, uh, everyone in the the war zone in Iraq was uh, exhausted and demoralized and wounded psychically, psychologically by the ever present these ever-present sounds that were not just noises, right? So I have, living in New York, uh, there, I live in a neighborhood where there's always, uh, there's never not construction noise. There's always a jackhammer going And that jackhammer may be, depending on how close I am to it, louder than an AK-47 going da 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 But the, 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 the fact is that for me, that jackhammer is, is annoying 
uh, and deleterious to my hearing, but not uh, not weaponized in a way that, you know, it, like you could say that the sonic characteristics may be exactly the same, let's say for the sake of argument, right? Same decibels, same, same rate. But the experience is absolutely fundamentally different for people who are exposed to sounds that are connected with these acts of violence. So that's the, that's the crux of my argument. And I, I, I appreciate the fact that, um, that there are people in this audience who uh, have had direct contact with those sounds that are more than sounds. Okay. Uh, but that's not really my answer, that's the beginning. Yeah. That's okay. The beginning. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Então, então ele está dizendo aqui que ele se sente muito, muito gostou do, 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 da sua intervenção, né? E quando ele diz que tenta fazer uma correção, né? Agora sobre os argumentos do livro, né? De, de, de separar a experiência da guerra da experiência cotidiana, ele pensa exatamente em lugares como o Brasil, que vive exatamente no meio do caminho. Né, o, entre a guerra e o, o, a paz, né, digamos assim. E no caso aqui, é interessante também que tem corte social. Porque dependendo, do, dependendo da sua classe, dependendo da quantidade de recursos que você tem, você pode estar fora disso, ou você pode estar totalmente dentro e ter uma, uma vida é, em que você é muito parecida com a vida de quem está na zona de combate no Iraque, né? Mas é, o que ele também quer deixar claro é que embora o som da britadeira ele convive com o som da britadeira é, diariamente perto da casa dele, e embora o som da britadeira possa ser muito parecido ou até mais é, agressivo do que o som do Maca 47 Existe uma diferença fundamental entre o som da britadeira e o som da, K, da K47. Eles podem ter o mesmo nível de decibéis, a mesma composição, é, é, ocupar o mesmo espaço em espectro harmônico, é, harmônico de frequências, né? mas tem uma diferença fundamental de que, é o, de que o som da britadeira não é, é uma arma. Né? Então ela não pode matar, digamos assim. So in, uh, in Iraq, I had to make a distinction between, I'm, I'm now referring to um, this, the, the thing that now I think two people brought up about police using shooting as a technique for tr controlling the population, right? So they're not necessarily shooting in order to kill people, but shooting in order to repress, right? Uh, that, that too went on. Uh, it was very common. Um, that was a common tactic of uh, Iraqi policemen before the war started where uh, they, would, they would shoot AK-47s you know, up in the air in order to clear an intersection. And it was a tactic that uh, American military people learned from Iraqi police uh, you know, to, to sort of use in this very loud urban environment uh, where gunfire can kind of cut through uh, to, to use uh, gunfire that way. And so I had to make a distinction between what I called uh, pure, pure acoustic weapons and hybrid acoustic weapons. There were some acoustic weapons that, that only made sound, and they were regularly used, you know, uh, like PSYOPs loudspeakers. Uh, but then there are these other things that, that kind of could cut both ways at any moment, right? Could turn from one kind, of, one kind of weapon into another at any moment, or could be both simultaneously. And you could argue that uh, even when, you know, I'm, I'm shooting even when someone is shooting to kill someone else, they are, they are, the, the sonic affordance of that thing, you know, uh, is far greater, exceeds that of the directional bullet that is going on. So, so like a gun is always a hybrid acoustic weapon. Então, é, o que ele está dizendo aqui é que essa técnica de usar é, tiroteios como forma de é, amedrontar e controlar a população, ela também era usada é, no Iraque, inicialmente pela polícia iraquiana, que costumava usar as AK-47 atirando para o alto, né, para fazer o barulho e assim dispersar a população. E essa técnica foi aprendida pelo, pelo exército americano, 
que também começou a usar essa técnica com forma de é, limpar a, a área. Mas o interessante é, é entender que o som da arma é, ele sempre vai ser um som que é em si uma arma. Né? Porque se eu atiro em você, né? mesmo que o, o tiro não atinja o nosso amigo do outro lado, né? ele também vai ser atingido pelo som da arma e vai pensar que ele pode estar sendo também alvejado. Né? Então, é, existe a, a, uma questão, assim, ele não falou esses termos, mas no livro aparece muito essa questão de que a violência, a, a violência sonora ela é sempre omnidirecional, ela vai para todos os I think Pedro and I need to co-write an article together because I sense that his his translations of my answers are much better than my answers. So it's like we, we, we definitely need to be work on this together. So um, about the ideological divisions uh, between populations, uh, that too tracks with my experience. Uh, my I, I, one of the quotes that I had was of an Iraqi friend of mine named Tarek who was complaining that the Chinook helicopters that would fly right over his house were so, the, the sound of them was so profound that uh, the dishes would, would, the sound would cause the dishes to fall off the table and crash. And so he complained to the American authorities of who, who were operating the airbase right next to him. And they said, you don't understand, the helicopter is the sound of freedom, right? So the, you know there was this this attempt, right? If if the sound if the sound is connected to violence, but it's violence that's directed at your enemy, you know can you know, there's there was this kind of campaign to say this is you know you should be exhilarated by this sound. This should be this sound. You know you should be happy when your your dishes crash onto the floor because this is the sound of the instrument that is keeping you safe, right? But so some people like some some people learn to like the sounds of outgoing fire. No one likes the sound of incoming fire. Então é, essa experiência também da divisão de classes ela existia também no Iraque e lá no caso é, um som que era sempre é, entendido como um som de paz era o som do helicóptero, né? O som do helicóptero significava paz porque em princípio era o som do, da, da, daquele que estava ali para libertar isso e tinha assim um, um, uma divisão aí também que é social né e enfim o que parece é que todo mundo gosta do som que do, do som de arma que não está sendo apontado para ele né é quase como se o som que fosse dirigido ao inimigo é aquele som que pelo qual eu tenho que, eu tenho que admirar né é o som pelo qual eu tenho que vibrar né mas ninguém gosta do som da arma quando ele é direcionado a você. É, ele usa esse termo, né? o som para fora e o som para dentro. Né? Ou seja, o som que, tá, que você está fazendo contra o seu inimigo versus o, o som que o seu inimigo está fazendo contra você. Então, aqui é um comentário que eu quero adressar a todos os três perguntadores, porque eu estou realmente sentindo que vai haver muito diferença entre a experiência experiences that people have had here and experiences that I tracked there. Uh, there's an anthropologist named Carolyn Nordstrom who has done uh, ethnographic work in a number of war zones in Mozambique and in Bosnia and other places. And she says, there is something, there, there is a difference between being in Mozambique and being in Bosnia uh, and being in Central African Republic Uh, and being in Iraq. Translate that part first in the moment. Então, é um outro comentário que ele, que ele tem que fazer, que ele quer fazer, que de alguma forma está é, endereçado a todos, todas as três perguntas, é de que é, ele conhece uma, uma antropóloga, que é etnógrafa, que fez trabalho de campo em diversas áreas de guerra, né, Moçambique e. Bósnia, etc, 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 e que embora tenha uma semelhança, na verdade também é importante pensar que a guerra é diferente em cada lugar. Right, né? so there's a difference. There, there's a difference. But at the same time, she says, there is also the coeval, uh, homogeneous experience of victimhood, 
And so, so she's saying that there is something, you know, she doesn't want to erase the distinctions between Brazilians and Iraqis, let's say, right? But she also wants to say that in, in this world, uh, the world in which we live, there are common shared experiences and uh, we ignore them at our peril. The reason that these experiences are common is because we live in a world where military uh, experiences of violence are common, is partially because we're human, but also because we live in a world in which military technologies and military tactics are shared. They're globalized, right? So, so you know, it's, it's a difficult ethnographic, political, ethical problem to grapple with, you know, how to, how to acknowledge the distinct aspects of life while also acknowledging that, that you know, we live, we live in a world where ideologies between our two countries are, are shared, right? Not, not 100%, but that there, there's, there's enough of a kind of a commonality that, you know, we can, we can, we need to begin understanding our experiences as being, you know, kind of broadly horizontal. So she says there's this broad horizontal kind of category of victimhood to armed violence uh, that that uh, we need to take into account. Então, apesar das diferenças, também existem muitas semelhanças né, nessas zonas de combate. E ela quer dizer disso não para apagar as experiências locais, mas para dizer da possibilidade de uma experiência que é comum e que de alguma forma é transversal e transcultural da violência e das zonas de combate. Né? E, então, isso é importante até para pensar saídas conjuntas né? para esse tipo de coisa. Né? A gente vive hoje, Brasil e Estados Unidos vivem, vivemos em países que atualmente têm ideologias próximas ou semelhantes, embora não sejam 100%, são próximas. E isso, por outro lado, é, abre aí uma, uma, uma brecha para uma ação conjunta. Conjunta. And so the, um, so there's this broad horizontality. Now the thing that I have argued, that I have argued, that I think is a little more controversial, is that there is also a verticality. There is also a common dimension of experience that doesn't just link victims around the world, you know, people who are on the receiving end of violence, but also links victims and perpetrators. And sound is one of the ways in which violence distributes itself in an omnidirectional fashion. So the example that I use for that is this phenomenon called shooter's ear. This is, a, this is an actual phenomenon, but it's actually, it, 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 is, it serves as a metaphor too. Shooter's ear is what happens, it's a kind of a deafness that you get when you're um, shooting most shooters, most people who shoot long guns are right-handed. And so if you're shooting like this, it means that your, right, your left ear is closer to the muzzle of the weapon uh, and not protected by the shadow of your head. So, so left ear deafness is a common, feature in, uh, in among, among people who shoot guns. Now, uh, through sound, not only through sound, uh, I think we can, we can agree that, you know, sound has directional and omnidirectional characteristics, right? If I am talking to you, and I, you know, I can, I can, I can become more directional, right? I, I can use technologies to direct my voice to you, but it's still leaking and, and hitting paper, right? So there's a difference between me talking to you, you can hear my voice better than he can, right? Um, but directional and omnidirectional characteristics. I argue that violence too has directional characteristics, but also omnidirectional characteristics. And that does not equate, it doesn't mean that there is no difference between perpetrators and shooters and bystanders, of course there is. But it does mean that one of the reasons that violence becomes cyclical one of the reasons that it becomes so hard to uproot is because perpetrators too are being damaged. They're being damaged, you know, in this, in this relatively trivial way by sound, but they're also being damaged by participation in the act. And so until we begin parsing, you know, and, and you know, understanding the directional and omnidirectional characteristics of sound and violence, then I feel like we're missing a really important part of the puzzle. Então, ele diz que tem uma certa verticalidade na questão que, de alguma forma, une quem é violentado e o, violen e o violentador, né? quem realiza a violência e quem sofre a violência. E é nesse jogo é, de conexão entre, uh, entre uh, 
entre esses dois lados da violência que é, a violência se reproduz de alguma maneira, né? Ele tá e isso se torna bastante característico no som porque o som é tanto direcional como omnidirecional, né? Aquele jogo que ele fez aqui. Eu estou falando aqui, tá direcionando para você, né? e vocês estão escutando melhor do que ele está escutando, né? Mas ainda assim ele está escutando, né? E agora ele está escutando melhor ainda. Então existe Existem técnicas que vão fazer vocês escutarem melhor ou não. É o próprio microfone aqui tem, tem essa questão. Mas, enfim, o ponto é que se, se é, não quer dizer que a violência sofrida por aquele que comete a violência e por aquele que sofre a mesma violência, mas é, o próprio ato de cometer a violência é um ato que volta violentamente contra quem age violentamente. E é nesse jogo que a violência se, se, se continua e se reproduz. Because militaries around the world do not have that conception of violence. They consider violence to be particular and unidirectional. First off, they don't consider violence to be their they don't consider their action to be violent at all because it's not a violation, right? So they would just call it something neutral like action. But if they were to acknowledge that there is some violence, they would say, like, I'm about to shoot Pedro, right? And so so where is the where is the violence in this act? The violence sits on top of the bullet, right? So if I'm if I'm trying attempting to shoot Pedro and the bullet goes this way and a truck comes and intercepts the bullet, then Pedro's not a victim and there's no violent act that took place, right? Uh, but the the study the study of the study of sound and this expansive category in which people are not not only victims but victimized by the constant sounds of weapons, of bullets that never penetrate them, is, is sort of the key missing element. And the fact that I, in attempting to shoot Pedro, am also damaged, right? Uh, and that you, in witnessing the attempt, are, are, are also damaged, right? Uh, that's, the, that's the kind of hidden cost uh, that, that I think makes violence Protracted violence, such it's one of the things that makes it such a difficult thing to, to you know, to, like the war ends and you talk about reconciliation and stuff, and that's that's awesome. But um, we all know that the situation is more complicated. Então, é, a questão é que muitas vezes os militares ou os agentes da violência não entendem a ação deles como violenta, pra, como violência, como violenta da, em, de, de, no primeiro plano, né? E a violência, sim, ela é unidirecional, ela está na ponta da bala. Então, o um exemplo que ele colocou aqui é se ele está de um lado da rua e atira em mim, né? E um caminhão passa e intercepta a bala, essas pessoas vão dizer que não houve violência. Mas o argumento dele é que é, a violência está no, no, no próprio ato em si, em si e que ela afeta e vitimiza todos, todos os agentes envolvidos. Ela, ela vitimiza eu, que fui é, alvejado, mas que não fui atingido. Ela vitimiza quem atira, mas ela também vitimiza todos vocês que foram testemunhas desse ato violento. Né? É, então, é essa questão da, da, da omnidirecionalidade da violência que, fa, que é, se torna explícita é, com o som que faz a coisa toda ser difícil de ser erradicada, digamos assim. Ok, então, muito rapidamente, on Schaefer e o war being efficient when it's noisy, sim, uh, yeah, I, I, I think the shock and awe campaign that, um, that uh, began the war in Iraq was conducted with exactly this in mind. Uh, it was, I don't have the exact quote here, but the goal of the, the initial bombing campaign in the Iraq war in March 21st, 2003, was to disorient and psychologically defeat the enemy by overwhelming his sensorium. They weren't trying, they were trying to knock out a couple of kind of key institutions, you know, and, and like command and control centers and stuff like that. But what they really wanted to do was so overwhelm the, the citizenry and the military with the, the bright lights and much more the sounds of this attack that everybody would just realize that they can't compete with the American military. So that, you know, the, 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 the thing began with noise and, you know, lamentably, uh, all the U.S. soldiers have gone home, but uh, the, the destabilization and violence that was 
unleashed or, or you know, intensified by the American presence there continues, as we know, in Iraq and Syria and neighboring countries to this day. So there's no post, right? That's one of the reasons why post-traumatic stress disorder is a kind of a, a weirdly, you know, it's, it's, a weird, it's a weird name and it's, it's something that is much uh, more important to American discourse than outside because so many of the people that uh, are, are, you know, uh, victims of America's wars don't have the luxury of a post, right? It, it's only post if you go home to a safe place, right? Uh, and uh, we created an unsafe place where those, those behaviors that I've just tracked are still absolutely necessary. Uh, ele acredita que se bobear, o que, as pessoas que pensaram na estratégia de medo e choque para a guerra do Iraque, eles tinham em mente exatamente essa citação do, do Schaefer, porque a, a ideia era de... É, Atacar, os, os, atacar por meio de uma desorientação sensória né, do inimigo. Né? É, e isso coloca em questão a, a própria questão do trauma né, da guerra. E, por outro lado, é, não exatamente erradica a violência no Iraque, mas intensifica essa, essa violência no lugar. E, ao mesmo tempo, mostra absurdos de, absurdo de categorias como o distúrbio pós-traumático. Só é possível ter um distúrbio pós-traumático para aquele que volta para a sua terra. Quem permanece no Iraque permanece num lugar que está extremamente inseguro e continua vivendo aquelas, aquelas experiências. Né? Então, não existe um pós-trauma pro iraquiano. O pós-trauma é do americano que volta para casa. Right, and then very quickly on Brazilian World War II vets having memories of sound and European um, uh, people having memories of hunger. Uh, I think that's a really profound observation, actually. Uh, and it, it just, it, it draws my attention to a couple of things. One, that um, uh, the, that reason might have to do with the fact that, that that positionality matters uh, in war, but uh, more interestingly for us in, the con in this conference, I think it draws attention to the fact that there's never just listening, right? There's always listening, it's always taking place in a, a body, not an abstract body, but a body that has uh, you know, a particular chemical composition and, and you know, set of st stabilities and vulnerabilities at, you know, at that moment. Uh, and it's and some of those some of the some of the qualities that inflect listening are are human are universal. Some are um, are national. If we have time, I'd tell you a story about like a, a national difference in of listening in the Iraq War. Um, some are are what we would call cultural. Some are what we would call communitarian. Uh, and some are what we would call in, individual. And some are what we would call even kind of micro situational. So how do, we even, how do we even do what we do? How do we talk about listening as if it is a unified thing when it is so radically contingent? You know, so listening, listening through hunger is certainly a different thing. You know, I've, I've been, you know, I haven't, I haven't starved ever, but just in my own, you know, super bourgeois life, I've, you know, if I go to a concert and I don't, and on an empty stomach, it's, you know, it's, it's terrible. Uh, so, so uh, this just speaks to I think the the, the difficulty of this uh, the difficulty of work on uh, human processes like this because it's, it, it it stretches the bounds of language to do justice to the simultaneous universality, cultural specificity, individual specificity, and and radical situatedness of any act. É, então, ele está dizendo que tem uma questão aí que é de, de, dessa divisão que parece ser cultural, né, entre, ou situacional, né, mas que, por outro lado, aponta para a gente uma, um outro ponto, que é de como a própria escuta é situacional. Né, é, qual a diferença entre a gente escutar é, agora e escutar morrendo de fome? 
né? Que, que imagino que alguns deve ser o caso agora também, o caso está lembrando aqui. Mas, enfim. É, pensar essa, essa questão de que existem é, experiências de escuta que são compartilhadas, existem é, é, experiências de escuta que são individuais, existem é, experiências de escuta que são situacionais, até mesmo micro-situacionais. Né? Então, a escuta é um uma, é algo contingente, né? Tá dependente. E ele nunca é, passou fome, como provavelmente passaram as pessoas que participaram da Segunda Guerra. Mas ele já consegue minimamente imaginar o que pode ser isso quando ele pensa é, da situação em que ele entra num concerto de música com fome, né? Mas é a gente pensar que a gente nunca está simplesmente é, escutando e, sobretudo, que a escuta acontece é, situada em um corpo, um corpo que dá essa contingência ao sentido da escuta. Acho que é isso. Ah, alô, gente, muitas perguntas. É porque eu vou só vou pedir para a gente tentar ser o mais sucinto possível nas perguntas e na tradução. Tá, porque senão a gente não consegue fazer muitas perguntas. Assim. Deixa eu. É... Eu não vi quem me perguntou primeiro. Vou chamar você hoje e depois a gente vai uma segunda rodada. E aí eu acho que a gente vai ter que encerrar, tá?
Gostava só, queria ouvir um pouquinho mais dele sobre isso de, e, e também pensando na crítica de, de um, um tipo de Marx, bom, de Marx né, que, que colocaria o pós-estruturalismo é, como que não dá conta da estrutura da, da produção de capital. Então, pensando nessas estruturas maiores que ele está pensando no aquecimento global, até o militarismo é, é, regionalismo, é, hegemonia americana, né? mas também está apontando como essas estruturas que as pessoas desenvolvem também não é, realmente descrevem bem, né? não são estruturas rígidas, assim, né? tem que se mover e, e não necessariamente cabem ou, ou é, explicam né? o, a situação. Isso. Boa noite. É, vou fazer a pergunta em português e, como o Pedro ficou tão feliz de não ter que traduzir a pergunta da Shannon, eu também vou, depois eu traduzo a minha também. É, uh, Estou interessado em saber se o Martin vê conexões entre, uh, também não sei se eu entendi muito bem, se eu entendi isso a partir da pergunta, é, aquela diminuição da esfera ética que a gente alcança com os nossos sentidos, né, que diminui quando a gente está exposto a uma situação e requer da gente que a gente crie estratégias, né? E, e entre esse, esse, esse fenômeno dessa diminuição dessa esfera e outro fenômeno de, do crescimento de um, um outro, uma outra esfera que é mais é, individualizada, né? Que é uma esfera de fundo de ouvido e de conexão de internet e que está super ligada com um processamento algorítmico, né? Que, é, vai trazendo conteúdo e que vai colocando a gente em contato com, com pessoas e com, enfim, é, diversos tipos de, de mídia, né? So my question is, um, I'm interested in, interested in what you said about the limitation of our sphere of action, of ethical action, if I understood it right, if I didn't, that's a part of the question. Um, when we are um, under some situation, that uh, requires that from us. And uh, a relation between this, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, sorry, I lost the word. So that, that our sphere is getting smaller, connection between this, and the uh, amplification of another sphere, which is um, quite individualized. I mean, uh, headphones and internet connections, and uh, a lot of content that we receive and that we um, get in, in touch with and that, that are um, kind of routed to us by algorithms, I mean, uh, playlists and contacts, I mean, people that we uh, talk to and social media networks and stuff like that. So if there is a connection and how do you, what can you say about this connection if you see any at all? Bom, vou fazer a pergunta em português e você traduz. Eu achei o tema muito interessante, assim, vai muito para a minha linha de pesquisa também. É, quando eu realizei né, o espelho sonoro, que está exposto ali no, na, na entrada do, do bloco. É, o que me motivou a fazer aquela escultura foi ver uma foto de um soldado no abismo, beirando um abismo, um soldado inglês, à frente de um espelho sonoro, tentando ouvir o som do abismo de um possível inimigo que talvez viria um dia em um zeppelin. Né? Ele ficava ali 12 horas para tentar escutar um possível ataque inimigo. Depois foi descobrir que a maioria dos soldados eram cegos, tal, eles executavam os cegos para fazer essa escuta, né, esse possível ataque. E pensando nessa tecnologia né, de, de guerra, sem, né, da primeira guerra, já tem 100 anos e tem né, todo o seu desuso, mas ainda gera toda né, uma, uma evolução tecnológica, né, eu pensei, tá, se a gente quer que ressignificasse essa tecnologia de guerra no, no contexto contemporâneo, no contexto 
né, pós-guerra e no contexto artístico. Né? Daí foi essa ideia que eu tive de ressignificar uma estrutura de guerra num ambiente, um outro ambiente. Né? E pensando nessa, nessa forma, nessa estrutura, como ressignificar objetos de armas, né? é, armas em práticas artísticas ou de utensílios contemporâneos, né? mas ainda assim pensando na arte sonora, né? tipo, pensando quais outras possibilidades que teríamos né? para isso. Assim. Ah, pensando ainda mais assim, né? eu tomo como o Estado é o inimigo, eu estou sempre pensando que a gente tem que fazer atos revolucionários. E pensando tipo, na, nos morros, assim, o fogo de artifício também, né? Que, né? que poderia ser... Assim, um sinal de guerra, no caso lá, é um contra-golpe assim, para falar a droga chegou, a polícia está subindo. Então, a gente solta os fogos de artifício. Né? É, nas manifestações, aqueles habitos para desorientar cachorros, tal, né? também é, que são uma frequência super alta, desorienta os cachorros, eles ficam um pouco perdidos. E é, eu fico pensando em qual, qual estrutura, qual, como utilizar, reutilizar estruturas do poder contra o próprio poder, né? Eu faço uma peça né, com um grupo chamado Erro, chamado Jogo da Guerra, em que convida várias pessoas da, da rua, manifestantes, para ser ativista político, ou seja, pichar a igreja, sujar o banco, que, né? Caos, trazer o caos para a cidade em nome da guerra. Quando a polícia chega, a gente finge ser uma peça de teatro, ou seja, a gente começa a cantar ciranda. Então, como utilizar a estrutura do poder que significação do poder contra o próprio poder. Um, he sees lots of similarities among his his work, uh, his artwork that, that is there in front of block block D, uh, and what he told today here because he was inspired on the, the acoustic mirrors uh, in England, and he 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 notices that. Uh, the the soldiers who were in the acoustic mirrors they were blind, uh, as if they could be uh, better listeners waiting for the zeppelins and stuff like that. But uh, his his question is much has much to do with uh, how to use uh, power tools to counteract against power. He sees, uh, as examples, the fireworks of the drug dealers is, that is uh, both for uh, telling people drugs arrived, but also to tell people uh, that the police, the police is coming. And he also says about the uses of, of high whistles, whistles for dogs, to, for disorienting dogs of the police during demonstrations, right? And he says also about a, a play that uh, he takes part on a, on a drama group that, uh, no, no, no que vocês fazem antes, mas they, 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 make, uh, they, they, they play a subversive uh, thing and then when the police comes, they started acting as if it was a party, singing sirandas and those kind of stuff. So he's interested on how, uh, on you think, on, How do you think the use of power structures to fight power? Okay. okay, I'm going to try and be briefer than I was with the first round of questions. And so it's not me being rude, it's me being, trying to be nice because I realize that we're over time. Um, so Shannon, uh, I, I, I take your point. Uh, I d do not intend to say that, nor do I say that there are that there are no there there are no structures, right? Um, those structures exist, but um, my uh, experience talking to people led me to the conclusion that the ex the exigencies of survival regularly required that people bracket out their knowledge of them. Uh, and so, you know, I think there's, there's an enormous amount of work on the Iraq War, right? As there is on warfare generally. Uh, and uh, there's an enormous amount of work that 
elucidates the structural inequities that uh, that kind of are are causal uh, to war, those that exacerbate you know the the conduct of a war, uh, like the the. There's just an army of people working on those topics. Uh, so that's not my topic. My topic is a kind of, for lack of a better word, it's like a sound-centered microphenomenology uh, that is kind of valuing descri description, the, precisely the, the descriptions of human, of the complexities of human experience that have to be smoothed out in order to, for, for other people to do uh, work, you know, kind of work work that is like in the legacy of Marx. So I see that work is important, uh, and I see that my my work does not lead to any set of political prescriptions. Uh, but that's that's not what I'm attempting to do. So you know, right? Uh, and I'd love to talk to you about that more. Uh, as for the limitation. <laughs> Okay. Uh, rapidamente, então, é só que é, ele entende que é, não quer dizer que não existam as estruturas, as estruturas elas existem, as estruturas de, de disputa elas existem, elas estão aí, mas ao mesmo tempo, é, conversando com as pessoas né, no Iraque em situação de guerra, ele percebeu que apesar é, para sobreviver, as pessoas tinham que esquecer, é, esquecer ou deixar de lado né, é, essa estrutura para poder efetivamente agir. Né? É, sim, eu, eu já sou eu interpretando, é como se as pessoas tivessem introjetado essa estrutura de tal forma, como se elas não precisassem de agir, de, de pensar nessas estruturas para poder agir. E se você para para pensar na estrutura, você vai morrer você, no meio do tiroteio. Né? E é claro que tem toda uma questão aí de trabalho, marxista, etc, 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 e que ele entende, sim, que o trabalho dele não faz propostas é, é, de como agir politicamente para mudar essa situação, mas, ao mesmo tempo, essa não é a proposta dele de prescrever uma ação política. Né? Acho que é, a questão é mais de colocar isso como uma questão. Okay, and on the, on the question of the limitation of the sphere of ethical action and how it might pertain to uh, headphones, algorithms, social media, I think that's super, super interesting. Uh, and it's really something that I, haven't, that I haven't attempted to kind of think through. Uh, I will say that um, when, okay, when I went, when I went to Iraq, uh, I was being ferried around by, like, in different U.S. military vehicles from kind of one area to another, uh, and then let, let out to make sound recordings. And uh, when I first got there, I had none of these striations. There were no, there was there, all I had was one vast zone of indeterminacy and terror. Uh, I heard. I felt like I I was I heard everything and was scared by everything. So all, all I, I had no audible and audible whatsoever, uh, nor did I have a narrational zone, nor did I have any tactics, right? Uh, and it, it was only, you know, uh, toward the end of my, my trip that, that I, I developed very rudimentary skills um, that allowed me to sort of discern that something was so far away that I didn't need to put my helmet on. Um, with with headphones, uh, you know, I I collected a large number of stories of people wearing headphones uh, and and earplugs and stuff in the in the combat zone. So I think the headphone question is is really interesting. Um, uh, I think in in a one of the side benefits, like what's the main benefit of doing work on uh, a subject like this? The main benefit is to illuminate the complexities of life for the people who are ensnared in this just absolute fucking mess. But there are these weird side benefits. 
And the side, one of the, you know, this, I find them regularly, and this is potentially one of them, where when you're charting an experience that is so extreme, there are things that are kind of subtly present in less extreme circumstances, but so subtly that we wouldn't notice them. So, um, you know, the, the, the ethical ramifications of putting on headphones in a war zone are, are stark. Uh, the ethical ramifications of putting headphones on in New York City are less so. But that doesn't mean that they're not there. So this is me saying that I'm, I, I want to think through with you what, what a project, you know, on look, looking at, looking at that, kind of, that kind of active closure uh, and the, the, you know, more mechanized closures that, uh, that other technologies kind of involve for us. Now, you're going to stop me and say. Então, sobre essa questão dos algoritmos e etc, né, ele está dizendo que é uma questão interessante que eu não tinha pensado tanto, mas sobre a questão, quer dizer, quando ele chegou lá, ele não tinha nenhum tipo de aprendizado sobre como escutar, como escutar a guerra, então era tudo muito novo, mas ele acompanhou muito é, e fez gravações com os soldados americanos e percebeu mesmo como essa coisa do, do, do fone de ouvido é onipresente, tá? O tempo inteiro na guerra, os, os soldados estão o tempo inteiro com fones de ouvido, seja para escutar música, seja para receber ordens superiores, e eles, de alguma forma eles são conectados ali pelos equipamentos né, que estão acoplados aos corpos. Né? E, por outro lado, a experiência na rua é também, na, na cidade, em Nova York, também todo mundo está ligado é, em um fone de ouvido. De novo, não é, é igualar essas duas experiências, mas perceber como existem continuidades é, nesses vetores de violência, por assim dizer. And then on the question uh, uh, kind of relating to the acoustic mirrors in, in England and how to use power tools to counteract power, I think that's a really provocative question too. Um, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure how, how to answer it because in the situation with Iraq, power tools were very, um, they were very, cautiously guarded, right? So the, the US military had this tool, this, this tool called the boomerang. And the boomerang was a multi-microphonic array, like a star-shaped uh, array of microphones that was mounted on a post that itself would be mounted on a military vehicle and it was connected to a fairly powerful computer. So the, the boomerang could, could, could detect the sound of uh, a bullet whizzing by it anywhere, anywhere within a certain range of the vehicle, and it, it would, this robot voice inside the car would say, you know, shots fired, azimuth, and it would, it would tell you how far away, what direction, and how high or low, right? With a far greater accuracy than any, than any person could, could possibly do. So that was, you know, the, the US military has, you know, invested literally, you know, billions upon billions of dollars on these technologies that, that, that were not available to other people. The military also had uh, very, you know, state, at that point, state-of-the-art headphones that amplified soft ambient sounds, but um, there was a little piston that would kind of pop into place at the second that uh, an impact sound would happen. So they would protect the ear against an impact sound but uh, amplify, so it really was like a kind of a cyborgian um, kind of thing. Now, what did Iraqi civilians have? They had fucking, they had cotton balls, right? They had cotton balls, they had NyQuil, you know, they, they were using, they weren't using power tools, they were cobbling together, you know, uh, other tools kind of in service of survival. So, um, I, 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 I'm sure that there, that there are, and I'm just not thinking of them, uh, moments in which either either the U.S. military or the you know insurgency uh, or the sectarian fighters tools were were used against you know used in creative ways, creatively misappropriated. But um, but I think those uh, you know the the most moving appropriation, the most moving kind of survival tool that I that I encountered was one I put the quote up there. You know this Iraqi grandmother whose 
you know, who was terrified by the sounds that she was hearing, but was listening empathically as, as if through the ears of the young children of her grandchildren who were in the house, knew that they would be more scared than her. And so what tool did she have at her, her exposer? She, she had literally just her arms. And so, you know, she, she embraced, she created this, this fleshy microacoustic territory for, for these children within which the sounds were less scary than they were outside, right? And there were just so many incidents of these, these you know, sort of creative improvisatory techniques uh, that, that, that's what moves me more, you know, so, so yeah, I hear, I hear what you're saying and I'm, and I'm really interested in uh, the use of kind of off-the-shelf technologies uh, in a, in a, in a uh, kind of a subversive fashion. And I'll just need to think about that more in the Iraq context. Ele achou a pergunta muito boa, eu também achei o comentário, mas ele quer realçar a questão de que existe uma... Uh, não dá para comparar as, as armas que os, o, o exército tinha com as armas que os iraquianos tinham, tinham né? e ele dá assim, alguns exemplos de algumas tecnologias que foram criadas e gastaram milhões e milhões de dólares para serem desenvolvidos por exemplo, o boomerang que era um poste que ficava em cima do carro com um arranjo de microfones que conseguia escutar os tiros e, e isso tudo era é, conectado a um computador e o computador calculava com uma precisão impressionante é, a distância, a trajetória do tiro, etc. Ou então é, o fone de ouvido que os, que os, é, os soldados usavam. Eu já sei que os Iraquis chamavam o Boomerang, o seu nome para isso era o Death Octopus. Ah, o nome do Boomerang era é, informal, o nome informal era o. É, o povo da morte, né? Então assim quer dizer e essa coisa de assim que um tiro acertava o um carro esse esse fone de ouvido cancelava totalmente o som de forma que protegia a audição dos, dos soldados americanos. Enquanto isso as tecnologias que, que estavam disponíveis para os iraquianos eram é, algodão para colocar nos ouvidos para proteger do som ou então a, a experiência de uma avó que para proteger os filhos ou os netos né, abraçava as crianças para acalmá-las mas ao mesmo tempo é, criando aí uma um, um território acústico que acalmava, mas também protegia sonoramente essas crianças. Né? Então, existe uma disparidade que é estrutural é, na, nas armas disponíveis. Né? Então, assim, é, essa, essa é uma questão, mas ele precisa de pensar mais sobre é, isso das, das armas do, dos iraquianos. Depois, deixa eu fazer, infelizmente, uma última rodada, três perguntas, tem uma aqui que já estava tá com o tempo, eu vou... Vocês podem se sortear, eu não tenho não esse trabalho. E eu vou pedir para vocês, eu vou pedir para vocês também, novamente assim, vamos ser sucintos, tá? Pode ser você? Muito bem. É ok to ask you to talk about something you didn't talk about? Or... Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to translate that to you. Thank you. Um, and it's partly maybe a, an answer to our colleague here uh, asked. I really like how you ended your book and also you, you presented it at different times. I studied at SEM two years ago and the way people misheard sounds and created a different sound, how, I mean, a different music yeah. out of the sound. Do you mind just talking about it briefly because it's so beautiful? I'd be very happy. So, estou a perguntar, estou a perguntar porque o livro dela acaba com uma vinheta, uma experiência de de pessoas de Jaquias que têm uma tecnologia, uma uma técnica para desouvir ou ouvir mal ou transformar o som que ouvem e estou a pedir ela para falar nisso porque é muito é muito bonito e gosto muito. Uh, 
uh, thank you for your speech. And uh, I'm thinking when one is in an extreme situation as a war zone, uh, what can be damaged to the point of the game death. And uh, we were uh, talking also about a kind of ethical deafness. Uh, you're incapable of listening to other people, incapable of listening to different points of view. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to compare the situations of uh, traumatic uh, deafness and the ethical deafness, but there is a, a kind of relation between uh, those inca incapaci incapacities, okay? And I want you, I want you to uh, talk a, a little bit more about it. Thank you. Em traduzir, né, esse trabalho do Pedro. Eu falei para ele dessa situação em zonas de guerra que a gente pode, no limite, ficar surdo e dessa, desse, dessa aproximação com uma espécie de surdez é, social, né, de, de uma surdez ética. Né? A gente não consegue ouvir pessoas, né, escutar pessoas que são muito diferentes, que pensam diferentes. E, claro, não quero comparar é, o trauma né, da, da, das pessoas que perdem a audição em situações estranhas, mas queria que ele se aprofundasse um pouco nessa, nesse paralelo entre né, essa é, surdez traumática e uma surdez ética. Só uma brincadeira do efeito do fato de que a tradução é trabalho meu. Não, gente, vamos fazer esse trabalho sendo um trabalho de todo mundo. Vai ser bom para todo mundo se todo mundo traduzir. Um, well, um, firstly, thank you for your, your talk. It was awesome. And uh, I'll talk to you and then I'll translate. But uh, I know an artist that uh, did did something like this, um, trying to uh, work with power structures. Uh, he was uh, nominated for the Turner Prize this year. I searched for his name because I couldn't remember. It's Lawrence Abu Hamza. Oh, yeah. yeah, and he, well, you know his work, so I'll just explain to him later. And uh, my question is just, I don't know if it's a question, but it's like, um, as the colleague said about the parallel of this um, listening and, and traumas, but thinking about uh, this like ideological war that we are facing um, in Brazil and in, I think in USA also, like um, to think about how the um, the speech of people in power are now like weapons because I don't know. How is the situation in USA? But here, the power of the speech of our actual president has killed people. You know, so how like the sound in this uh, space of voice and expression can also create this uh, surreal and uh, I don't know <laughs> this space of war that you have pointed. Hi, Petro Zito. É, na primeira casa que eu, eu comentei com ele que tem um artista é, que foi é, nomeado, nomeado para o Turner Prize esse ano, o nome dele é Abu Lawrence Abu Randans, e ele tem um trabalho que basicamente ele, tipo, não é exatamente isso, mas enfim, ele pegou é, dados, enfim, registros de manifestações na rua e etc. E ele, ele criou um algoritmo que ele conseguiu é, identificar o som é, de balas que eram balas reais e balas de borracha. Então, o trabalho dele é um pouco a partir das, da sua questão de como de se utilizar essas estruturas de poder para... Né, enfim, achei que é um bom exemplo, bem interessante. E aí a pergunta que eu fiz para ele era um pouco de, desse paralelo que o colega ali já, já pensou, mas pensando na situação contemporânea que a gente está vendo hoje no Brasil, nos Estados Unidos, de como que o discurso né, de pessoas no poder uh, também é uma arma, e a gente viu e está vendo no Brasil, principalmente, como que a palavra mata, né? Enfim, como que essa situação de guerra, para além de uma guerra no Iraque, etc., também está sendo... Como que o som pode, então, ser utilizado nesses lugares? Uh, thank you. I will try to take these in reverse order. 
so yeah, I think Lawrence Abu Hamdan is doing uh, really amazing, amazing work. Everyone who is interested in the intersection of sound and violence should should look him up. I I also though you know I made I made this point in the paper uh, about the the I don't know if it's a limitation or if it's um, just a danger uh, of using, I think that's, this is kind of a core part of my argument, right? Is that it's, it's uh, dangerous to use sound uh, to kind of uh, try to illuminate the intersection of sound and violence. So I have this colleague who I mentioned, Suzanne Cusick, who uh, did all this work on, on music being used in detention programs. And I was just recently, at a, uh, like last week, at a conference on uh, music and trauma in Greece, and I heard, uh, you know, th there are, there, in Greece they also used music uh, to torture detainees. Uh, in Russia they did. I would be not at all surprised if in Brazil's uh, history, you know, especially during the military dicta dictatorship, that that kind of thing was going on. And there are a number of artists who are trying to use, trying to kind of create um, like replications of these experiences. So they create kind of chambers that look like detention chambers and bombard, you know, there's sounds and there's flashing lights in there and there's maybe screaming and stuff. And it, to me, all of them, have, they, 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 they share the same problem, right? Which is that they are presenting uh, sounds to to bodies that are not uh, not constrained in the way that uh, the bodies were. They're presenting sounds to people who are free to leave when they get freaked out. And so, so uh, I, I I always worry about this the the misimpression that oh I know what that's like oh now I know what that's like oh that was really intense mm, yeah that uh, you know but it was also kind of exciting you know it's all like, like a roller coaster you know that that sort of disnification of of the process, I think that's a real uh, challenge. Uh, and it's a challenge that, that is kind of specific to sound, right? So uh, I work with uh, an Iraqi painter named Haib Karaman who has um, painted uh, a number of very stylized paintings that you know, kind of deal with sonic violence. Uh, and she's, she created these paintings where um, she put anechoic foam behind the canvas and then used a knife to kind of slice out. So these, the, the canvas itself is a sound absorbing um, work. So the canvas itself is, is a, like symbolically and a little bit literally kind of soaking up uh, some, of, some of the sounds that, uh, you know, the, the kind of residue of the war. And I'm really moved by that work. Uh, you know, I'm moved by Lawrence Hamdan too. So uh, I don't know, I just, I'm, I'm, I, yeah, I, I, approach, I approach the artistic use of sound to illuminate situations of violence with great trepidation. Um, with great? Fear. Yeah, okay. Worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, então, ele está tá dizendo que ele, ele conhece o trabalho da, do artista, gosta, é, e estava lá nessa outra conferência na Grécia sobre... É, som e trauma e a questão que parece muito de que é, por, um lado, por, esse, por um lado é fascinante essas obras artísticas com o, o com sons da guerra por outro lado é algo a se temer né? porque por um lado você se pega na, na experiência de tentar identificar o que é o que, ou, ou qual é a, a, o risco né, daquela situação e etc. Mas, por outro lado, quando você faz esse exercício de tentar identificar o que é o que, você está fazendo esse exercício do seu lugar seguro, né, onde, na verdade, você não está vivendo aquilo. Né? Então, ele é, gosta, gosta de tomar muito cuidado com esse, com esse tipo de, 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 de trabalho. Ele falou de uma outra pintora iraquiana que pinta e ela depois corta a tela né, de forma que a, tela, a pintura se transforma também em um, um, 
um artefato que absorve som. Né? Então, é como se a pintura que fala da guerra absorvesse também parte desse som. Mas, enfim, tudo isso para dizer que é uma faca de dois legumes, né? assim, nesse sentido de que ele tanto dá, tem essa, esse lado fascinante, como também coloca a gente numa situação que, na verdade, não é a situação da guerra. E then really briefly on the weaponization of speech, uh, which I think is a hugely important topic. Uh, I don't have time to go into it, but let me just recommend a brilliant article by my colleague Mary Louise Pratt, P-R-A-T-T. -T. Um, she wrote it several years ago. It's called Harm's Way, colon, Language and the Arts of War. And it deals precisely with the weaponization of speech, and it was really influential for me. Harm's Way, Language and the Arts of War. I think that's what it's called. Mary Louise Pratt. You don't need to translate that. Não, é só indica, indicação de, uma, de um artigo que dá, lida com essa questão da transformação do discurso como arma, em arma. As for the relationship between physiological deafness and ethical deafness, uh, uh, I, I, I feel like you and I could talk about this for a very long time. One, I'll, I'll just mention one, one thing that's on, the, on my mind at the moment, and that is You know, there's been, within sound studies and anthropology, there's been an enormous amount of work in the last, I feel like it, it began happening about 10 years ago, on deaf culture. Uh, and it, it has some sort of interesting intersection with disability studies. Um, uh, some of the work is coming from deaf scholars, and a lot of the energy behind that work Uh, has to do with kind of depathologizing deafness. So I, uh, I want to be very careful in talking about the, that relationship, not to fall into a, a kind of a trap that says of, of some sort of, it, it would be kind of auditory determinism, right? That would, that would if, if we were to make a smooth equation between, between that, because of course, um, deaf people are, are uh, if I can make this generation, just generalization, much more attuned and sensitive to the world than most hearing people think they are, right? So, so we, can't take, we can't make any kind of isomorphic link between those two things, but we can say that the kind of deafness that was the number two injury in the Iraq war for all parties um, has been absolutely debilitating uh, for, for every single person that I've talked to. Um, who has who has suffered from it? There, there's, there's. I, I've, I have yet to meet someone who has said that they were empowered by the their hearing loss in this wartime context. Although we know that there are people like Thomas Edison, you know, who was deaf, said uh, his deafness was like an evolutionary step that that in you know against against all of the chaos of modernity. You know that I can I can I can have my own thoughts walking through the streets. Uh, and you are just, you know, cowed by, by the sounds there. So, so I, think, I think there's a really, a really kind of interesting thing to work out there. Um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. And then, uh, yeah. Uh, essa questão da surdez ética versus a surdez fisiológica, um assunto que o Dr. Ipeca fala no horas e horas e horas e horas a fio, mas ele trouxe aqui a questão dos estudos de disabilities, né? Do, dos estudos, pessoas que é, estudam deficientes, né? E um campo muito proeminente disso é exatamente as pessoas que estudam a surdez, né? E existe um esforço nesse campo de depatologizar a disabilidade, depatologizar a surdez. Né, no sentido de afirmar para nós que escutamos que as, as pessoas surdas não são tão insensíveis assim sensori sensorialmente quanto a gente imagina. Né? Ah, a, 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 ser surdo não significa que você não escuta, né? basicamente é esse o argumento. Mas também é, pode ajudar a gente a entender que nem sempre a surdez é, vai ser... A, a, a surdez poderia ser benéfica, por exemplo, ele inclui fala da, da, da questão de algumas pessoas, alguns iraquianos, para quem a surdez se tornou uma bênção, porque se tornou uma forma de deixar de conviver com a violência e com os tiros. Né? Outra, outro exemplo que ele deu é do Thomas Edison, que era surdo e achava isso uma bênção, porque isso 
era algo que permitia fugir da modernidade e, da, e do ruído da modernidade. E, como eu dizia, né, eu posso andar na rua é, concentrado nos meus próprios pensamentos, enquanto vocês que escutam estão aí tendo, tendo que lidar com todo o barulho da modernidade. Né? Okay, and for the last question, thank you so much. I think, you know, this this uh, this has been a dark number of years for me. I've been working on on you know since uh, 2006, I guess, uh, on uh, on the war, and I continue to work on it. And I've there really were so few life affirming stories among the testimonies that I took. Uh, Vir virtually, there, like, really only one, uh, and I, and so, you know, I ended my book with it because uh, I was so struck by this story, and I'll tell you the story now, and um, we won't make Pedro translate it, we'll say that um, it's in, it's published in the book, and we'll Google translate it and send it out to people who want it, uh, in, in Portuguese, so that, because you're all tired, I'm tired, we're hungry, we're listening with hungry ears. So uh, I met a guy named Tarek. He's the same guy who, uh, whose dishes kept breaking because of the helicopters. And Tarek was this, is this uh, delightful, goofy, funny, uh, tall, lanky, Iraqi dentist, young, young guy. Still lives in Iraq. And during uh, a, a particularly bad period of the war, he lived in uh, this neighborhood in Baghdad called Al Binok, and that neighborhood was unfortunate enough to have um, a uh, Mahdi army base on one side, a Sunni militia base on the other side, and an American forward operating base, kind of trying, like created this triangle. And so there were there were there was a stretch in the summer, the hot summer of I think it was 2006, when um, Tarek, who lived with his mom. Um, they, no one on the street could leave their houses at all. The electricity uh, grid had failed, so they had no air conditioning um, or power. Uh, but there were Kalashnikov battles on their street uh, just kind of nearly every day and with, with no great predictability. So everyone was kind of in a situation of being pinned down. Uh, and you know, they would, they, they knew that there were some times that were a little safer than others and they'd run out and get food and then come back. And Tark and his mom, for that period where hours of every day were spent here, exposed to the sounds of Kalashnikovs up and down on their street and occasionally M4s from the Americans, uh, they were just sitting there. There's nothing to do. And so they came up with this kind of game which involved them it was, it was, it was a, a, a game of imaginative listening. It involved them imagining that the sounds of guns that they heard outside their house were not guns, but were the sounds of this particular Iraqi drum called a zambur. It's a very old Bedouin drum that has a, a tiny head like this, and then goes out like this, and uh, you, you play with finger rolls like this, and it goes and uh, the sound is similar to, you know, coincidentally similar to that of, of uh, AK-47s. So they sat there on the couch, through listening, turned the sounds of gunfire into the sounds of the drum, and then imagined the music that would logically accompany that percussive, that percussive track. So they were composed, these are non, this is a dentist and his mother, right? Uh, kind of pacifying, the, through listening, pacifying the sounds, you know, they weren't aestheticizing them, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't immune to the fact, you know, they, didn't, they never forgot what they actually were, but through this act of will, they, they created a space within which they could musicalize them. And so their project of survival, that's a project of survival that took absolutely, you know, the, the only equipment was the imagination, really. Uh, and, and so they survived, right? And, uh, and uh, uh, I, he told me that story and I, I made him repeat it a couple times because I couldn't believe that he actually, that I was actually understanding him correctly, that he actually did it. Um, but apparently that's, that's 
what they did. And uh, that, uh, that incident, for me, it did a couple of things. It, it uh, was a powerful demonstration of, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a world in which I saw the human spirit kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, like so regularly crushed and uh, saw so many different kind of flavors of victimhood. It showed, you know, that, that, that through listening itself, right, um, through this weird kind of creative misappropriation of sound, um, one can craft a small, fragile project of survival. Uh, but it also got me attuned to the, the crazy, surreal space of the auditory imagination. So now I'm writing a book on the sounds that people hear in their heads. Uh, and that, that project dates back to uh, my buddy Tarek. So with, uh, I think we, should, we, can, we, can, we can end with, uh, with my thanks to you for your patience and uh, my thanks to Tarek uh, for everything else. Mm. And my thanks to Pedro for, for making my, my stuttering answer seem so smooth and melodious and, you know, resilient. Thank you. Nós não vamos traduzir isso, a gente vai fazer uma cópia pirata e mandar para quem. Uma cópia pirata traduzida e mandar para quem quiser. Até mais, hein? Uh, quero agradecer a presença de todo mundo. Uh, foi uma palestra maravilhosa. Quero agradecer o Martin, quero agradecer o Pedro. E lembro vocês que amanhã nós começamos de manhã, às 9 h e temos uma segunda palestra da Shannon Garland, amanhã às 18 horas. Boa noite para todo mundo e até amanhã.